Level zero. The barbecue is sizzling. Your friends are laughing. And someone just cracked open another cold one. It's a perfect July afternoon until you notice the conversation dying down. Everyone's looking up. The sky has transformed from brilliant blue to an ominous gray, and the trees at the edge of the yard are swaying harder than they should. A low rumble echoes in the distance, thunder. That distinctive scent hits you, ozone mixed with wet earth, and the first fat raindrops splatter on the hot grill, sending up little clouds of steam. This is a single-cell thunderstorm, the most basic type, and honestly, it's the weather equivalent of a participation trophy. These storms form when warm, moist air rises rapidly into cooler air above, creating a towering cloud that looks like cauliflower on steroids. They last maybe 30 to 60 minutes, dump some rain, flash a little lightning, rumble some thunder, and dissipate like they never existed. Single-cell storms are harmless compared to what's coming. Most people experience dozens of these in their lifetime and never think twice about them. A little rain, a little noise, maybe you have to postpone the barbecue. But here's what you need to understand. Every thunderstorm, no matter how massive or destructive, starts with the same basic ingredients, moisture, instability, and lift. When these three elements combine in just the right way, with just the right intensity, the atmosphere stops playing nice. But what happens when these single storms stop dying and start working together? Level one, now we're getting organized. A multi-cell cluster is what happens when single cell storms decide their strength in numbers. Instead of one convective cell forming, rising, and dying, you get multiple cells at different stages of development clustered together. One cell is just forming while another is mature and raining, and another is already dissipating. These storms can last several hours because new cells keep forming to replace the old ones. The rain comes in waves, heavy than light, heavy than light, the lightning increases. The thunder becomes more frequent, less like distant drums and more like artillery fire. Wind gusts can hit 40 to 50 miles per hour, strong enough to snap branches and knock over lawn furniture. What makes multi-cell clusters more dangerous is their unpredictability. They can spawn brief, weak tornadoes with little warning. They produce localized flash flooding because the rain keeps coming in pulses over the same area. And just when you think it's passing, another cell fires up. The way multi-cell clusters evolve is fascinating from a meteorological standpoint. The outflow from dying cells helps trigger new cells. The precipitation from mature cells creates cool pools of air that interact with the warm, moist inflow to generate new convection. It's a cycle that feeds on itself. But here's where it gets interesting. Sometimes, under the right conditions, these cells stop being individuals and start working together. They synchronize. They organize into something with structure, with purpose, with a kind of atmospheric intelligence that shouldn't exist but does. And when that happens, you're no longer dealing with a cluster, you're dealing with a line. What if that organization stretched not just across miles, but across entire states? A wall of storms 100 miles wide? Level two, picture a wall of storms stretching 100 miles across, moving forward like an advancing army. A squall line is a continuous line of thunderstorms, sometimes hundreds of miles long, marching across the landscape in formation. They form along cold fronts or ahead of them, where dramatically different air masses collide head on. The line can be 10 to 20 miles wide, and when it hits, it hits hard. The leading edge produces what's called a gust front, a surge of cold downdraft air that races ahead of the rain. Wind speeds at the gust front can exceed 70 miles per hour, strong enough to uproot trees and peel shingles off roofs. Then comes the rain, a wall of water so intense that visibility drops to near zero. Lightning strikes become so frequent they're almost continuous, turning night into a strobing nightmare of white flashes. These storms produce what meteorologists call a shelf cloud, a low horizontal cloud formation that looks like the mothership from Independence Day rolling over the horizon. Seeing one approach is genuinely terrifying if you understand what it represents. Tons of cold air being forced downward by the storm, spreading out at ground level, lifting warm air ahead of it to create new cells. Squall lines can maintain themselves for 12 hours or more, traveling 400 to 500 miles before finally weakening. They're responsible for the majority of damaging straight-line wind events in the United States. The physics of how they sustain themselves is elegant in its brutality. It's a conveyor belt of destruction. One of the most dangerous aspects of squall lines is their predictability combined with their inevitability. You can see them coming on radar hours in advance, but there's nowhere to go. If you're in the path, you're going to experience severe weather. The line is too long to drive around, too fast to outrun, too powerful to ignore. But as intense as they are, Squall lines are still democratic in their destruction. Everyone along the line gets hit roughly the same way. What comes next isn't shared. What comes next picks a path and obliterates everything along it. 
What if a storm didn't just organize but learn to rotate, to spin like a hurricane, but with the concentrated violence of a tornado factory? Level 3. This is where thunderstorms transcend into something else entirely. A supercell is a thunderstorm with a rotating updraft called a mesocyclone. That rotation is the key. While normal thunderstorms are chaotic, with updrafts and downdrafts fighting each other until the storm tears itself apart, a supercell separates these functions. The updraft spirals upward on one side, the downdraft descends on the other, and this organization allows the storm to sustain itself for six or seven hours, traveling hundreds of miles. The rotating updraft can be five to 10 miles in diameter, spinning at 100 miles per hour or more. The storm itself can tower 50,000 to 60,000 feet into the atmosphere, punching through the troposphere into the stratosphere. Supercells produce the most violent weather on Earth. Baseball-sized hail that falls at terminal velocity, crashing through windshields and punching holes in roofs. Tornadoes, often violent, long-track tornadoes that stay on the ground for dozens of miles. Wind speeds that can exceed 100 miles per hour, even without a tornado. And the lightning, constant, explosive, overwhelming. Standing in the path of a supercell, you'd see the wall cloud, a localized lowering of the cloud base where the mesocyclone is strongest. This is where tornadoes form. The air has a greenish tint from the way light scatters through the hail and rain. The sound is a continuous roar, like standing next to a jet engine, punctuated by explosive thunder and the hammering of hail. There are different flavors of supercells. Classic supercells have a clear separation between updraft and downdraft. Low precipitation supercells form in drier environments and are deceptively beautiful until the tornado drops. High precipitation supercells are rain-wrapped monsters where you can't see the tornado until it's on top of you. While only about 20 to 30% of supercells actually produce tornadoes, the tornadoes they do produce tend to be the strongest and longest lived. The EF4 and EF5 tornadoes that cause catastrophic damage are almost exclusively produced by supercells. The violent tornado that destroyed Moore, Oklahoma in 2013, killing 24 people, supercell. The El Reno tornado that reached 2.6 miles wide and killed several storm chasers, supercell. The Joplin tornado that killed 161 people in 2011, supercell. Supercells also produce some of the most intense lightning on Earth. Some supercells have been observed producing more than 100 lightning strikes per minute during their peak intensity. The internal structure of a supercell is remarkably sophisticated. The storm develops what's called a bounded weak echo region, or BWER, on radar. An area where the updraft is so strong that precipitation can't fall through it. This creates a vault of rising air that can be several miles tall. Around this vault, precipitation cascades downward, but the core remains almost rain-free. A testament to the sheer power of the updraft. Storm chasers can identify supercells from miles away by their visual structure. The anvil spreads out at the top like a blacksmith's tool. The main updraft tower rises like a massive pillar. And if you're in the right position, you can see the clear slot a rain-free area that wraps around the backside of the storm, marking where the rear flank downdraft is descending. These are the four fundamental types of thunderstorms, single cell, multi-cell, squall line, and supercell. Each represents a different level of organization, intensity, and threat. But these four types don't tell the complete story because sometimes these storms don't occur in isolation. Sometimes atmospheric conditions are so favorable that storms organize into larger systems that operate by different rules entirely and that's when things get truly dangerous. But what if the destruction didn't spin in circles? What if it carved a straight path of 100 miles per hour's winds for 700 miles without stopping? Level four, the word sounds like it should mean something elegant. Instead, it means widespread destruction. A derecho is a long-lived windstorm associated with a line of fast-moving thunderstorms. To officially qualify as a derecho, the wind damage must extend more than 240 miles and include wind gusts of at least 58 miles per hour but those are minimum thresholds. The really intense derechos produce wind gusts over 100 miles per hour across areas the size of multiple states. What makes derechos uniquely dangerous is their scale and duration. These aren't isolated severe storms. They're storm complexes that maintain destructive winds for six, 10, sometimes 14 hours straight, plowing through entire regions like an atmospheric lawnmower. The 2012 North American derecho traveled 700 miles from Indiana to the Atlantic coast, leaving 22 people dead and 4 million without power. The winds don't just gust, they sustain. Trees don't just lose branches, they're uprooted entirely or snapped in half. Buildings don't just lose shingles, they lose walls. Power lines don't just sag, they're torn down for hundreds of miles. The damage path can be 100 miles wide. The United States experiences an average of one to two major derechos per year, 
mostly in the Midwest and Great Plains during late spring and summer. They form when atmospheric instability combines with strong winds aloft, creating a self-sustaining system called a bow echo on radar. The mechanics of how derechos maintain themselves reveal something unsettling about atmospheric physics. The system becomes self-reinforcing. The strong winds aloft provide the shear necessary to organize the convection. The organized convection produces intense downdrafts. The downdrafts spread out at the surface as powerful straight-line winds, and these winds help lift more unstable air into the storm, feeding it, allowing it to continue. The psychological impact of a derecho is different from other severe weather. With a tornado, there's a specific threat you can shelter from. With a derecho, the wind just keeps coming, hour after hour, and there's nothing you can do but endure it. The real terror of a derecho is that it gives you no place to hide. With a tornado, you can be a mile away and be fine. With a derecho, if you're anywhere along a 500-mile path, you're in danger. But at least derechos move in a straight line. At least you can see them coming. What happens when storms merge into something so massive it creates its own weather system? Tornadoes, winds, flooding, hail, all at once? Across an area the size of multiple states? Level 5. Welcome to the apex predator of thunderstorm complexes. A mesoscale convective system spans 100 to 600 miles across. But that clinical definition doesn't capture what they really are. Self-sustaining storm factories that can dominate an entire region's weather for 12 to 24 hours straight. An MCS forms when multiple supercells and squall lines merge into a single organized complex, usually during the overnight hours. They develop their own circulation, their own internal dynamics. They create their own weather independent of the surrounding environment. The largest MCS events produce everything simultaneously. Tornadoes spin up along the leading edge. Destructive straight-line winds race outward from the core. Flash flooding occurs under the heaviest rain bands. Large hail falls in scattered swaths. And all of this happens across an area the size of Iowa or Missouri, affecting millions of people at once. The June 2020 MCS that crossed the central United States produced 140 severe weather reports in a single day. Wind damage from Nebraska to Pennsylvania, multiple tornadoes, widespread flooding, the radar signature was so massive it looked less like a weather system and more like a tumor growing across the map. What makes an MCS especially dangerous is timing. They often intensify at night when people are sleeping. The lightning provides the only illumination, brief snapshots of a world being torn apart. What's particularly insidious about MCS events is how they evolve. A system that starts as a relatively ordinary squall line can, over the course of several hours, organize into an MCS that dominates the weather across multiple states. The rainfall from MCS events can be catastrophic. Some MCS events have produced rainfall totals exceeding 10 inches over areas of thousands of square miles. The June 2020 derecho that impacted Iowa was actually part of a larger MCS event. The storm complex maintained severe winds for more than 14 hours, traveling from South Dakota to Ohio, producing widespread damage across Iowa that rivaled a major hurricane strike. In Cedar Rapids, winds exceeded 100 miles per hour, the damage exceeded $11 billion. And here's what keeps meteorologists up at night. MCS events are becoming more frequent and more intense. Climate change is loading the atmosphere with more moisture and more energy. The conditions favorable for MCS development are occurring more often and lasting longer. But even an MCS obeys certain rules. It stays within the troposphere. It eventually weakens. But what if a storm's updraft was so violent, so powerful that it didn't stop at the atmospheric ceiling? What if it punched through into space itself? Level 6. Most thunderstorms build upward until they hit the tropopause, the boundary between the troposphere and stratosphere, where a temperature inversion acts like a ceiling. The storm flattens out, spreading horizontally into that characteristic anvil shape. But sometimes, when the instability is extreme enough, when the updraft is powerful enough, the storm punches through. These are called overshooting tops, and they're a signature of the most violent thunderstorms on Earth. The updraft is so powerful, traveling upward at 100 to 150 miles per hour, that it blasts through the tropopause into the stratosphere, sometimes reaching 60,000 or even 70,000 feet. From space, these overshooting tops appear as bubbling domes above the anvil cloud, frozen in the negative 80 degree Fahrenheit stratosphere. The storms that produce overshooting tops are capable of nearly anything. They're the ones that drop softball-sized hail, produce EF4 and EF5 tornadoes, generate wind speeds rivaling Category 3 hurricanes. The updraft is so strong that hailstones can be cycled up and down through the storm multiple times, accumulating layer after layer of ice until they weigh several pounds. On the 22nd of May 2011, a supercell with a massive overshooting top struck Joplin, Missouri. The tornado it produced killed 161 people. 
the deadliest single tornado in the modern record. The storm's updraft was so intense that it lofted debris, including human remains, more than 100 miles downwind. These storms also produce sprites, jets, and elves, rare electrical phenomena that occur in the mesosphere and stratosphere above the storm. Red flashes, blue jets of light shooting upward, expanding rings of illumination spreading across the upper atmosphere. They're visible from space but almost never seen from the ground. The formation of an overshooting top indicates that the storm has access to an extraordinary amount of energy. The atmosphere below must be extremely unstable, with a steep temperature lapse rate and abundant moisture. Every factor must be optimized for extreme convection. When pilots encounter storms with overshooting tops, they give them exceptionally wide berths. The turbulence near these features can be catastrophic for aircraft. The updrafts can exceed the climb rate of even powerful jets, potentially carrying an aircraft upward uncontrollably. Satellite imagery of overshooting tops reveals their transient nature. They can develop and collapse in a matter of minutes as the updraft pulses. These storms represent the absolute upper limit of what Earth's atmosphere can produce under current conditions. They're the storms that generate the statistics that end up in record books. The largest hail, the strongest tornadoes, the highest wind speeds. As violent as these individual storms can be, they're still isolated events. They affect a relatively small area, they have a defined life cycle, and they eventually dissipate. But what happens when multiple storms of this intensity form simultaneously? What happens when the atmospheric conditions that produce one supercell with an overshooting top instead produce 10, all at once, across an entire region, with nowhere to run and nowhere to hide? That's when you get an outbreak. And that's when the death toll stops being counted in ones and twos, starts being measured in hundreds. And somewhere in the shifting patterns of our warming climate, the conditions for these outbreaks are changing. The energy is increasing. The instability is growing. The atmosphere is learning new ways to organize, new levels of violence it can achieve. And the scientists tracking these patterns are noticing something that keeps them awake at night. Something about the frequency, about the intensity, about what comes next. But that's a threshold we haven't crossed yet, haven't we?